Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com, and this is Antiwar News for Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. And the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today, Kamala Harris vows to defend the Philippines in the South China Sea. So Vice President Kamala Harris on Monday reaffirmed that an attack on Philippine vessels in the South China Sea would trigger a U.S. response under the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines. The warning to Beijing came as she was visiting Manila, and she said this in a meeting with President, the president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. She said, quote, an armed attack on the Philippines' armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft in the South China Sea would invoke U.S. mutual defense commitments. And that is an unwavering commitment that we have to the Philippines, end quote. So her warning came amid reports that there was just uh, another tense encounter between Chinese and Philippine vessels in the South China Sea, which happened uh, occasionally. Uh, the Philippine Navy said that a Chinese vessel blocked a Philippine naval boat on Sunday and forcibly seized uh, an item that they were towing, which appeared to be Chinese rocket debris. Um, for their part, China has denied that it was a forcible seizure and said that its vessel took the debris after having a friendly negotiation at the scene, is how China put it. And this incident happened near a Philippine-controlled island uh, or reef. A lot of them are just you know, big reefs in the Spratly Islands, which is a contested archipelago in the South China Sea. Um, the China and the Philippines have a lot of overlapping claims there. And they can, you know, China controls some islands, the Philippines controls some islands. And occasionally, you know, stuff like this happens. And you know, I wanted to highlight this and put it at the top of of the page, make it the top story, just because it's something that I think a lot of people don't realize is how involved the U.S. is in this maritime dispute. And the fact, I think, that they openly say, you know, we're willing to go to war if this thing turns hot, you know, if, if a Chinese, if one of these encounters turns deadly or, or just, you know, shots are fired, um, you know, we're, we're going to come in and, and go to war with China over it. It's just really uh, seems crazy to me. And China, now China and the Philippines, as I went over yesterday, I don't want to be too redundant on this issue. They have overlapping claims as well as uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, Brunei, and Taiwan as well. I believe Taiwan claims the same area that China claims. And the U.S. has rejected formally China, most of China's claims to the waters. But they haven't, um, you know, they've sided with the Philippines against China, but they haven't side sided with anybody else again. You know, it's not like they're taking the Philippines side against Vietnam or any other country. They're just really there to be against China. And part of this effort is that they sail U.S. warships within 12 nautical miles of Chinese controlled islands in the South China Sea. Those started under Obama and they ramped up under Trump and have continued at a pretty good pace under Biden. Um, so Harris, she's going to visit Palawan, which is a, a province in the Philippines. It's an island province on the South China Sea. She's going to be there Tuesday, Tuesday in the Philippines. So pretty soon after this show is posted, I'm sure some news is going to come out about that. And she's going to give a speech on board a Philippine Coast Guard vessel. So, you know, she's they're sending a message with this visit. And they're also working on expanding the U.S. military presence in the Philippines. They want to build some more facilities there. And while Harris met with Marcos, uh, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, was over in Indonesia, and he met with his counterpart and pushed for stronger military ties. The Pentagon said in a readout of the meeting that they agreed to expand military training and education, training courses and, you know, all sorts of military cooperation. Uh, but I don't, we're not going to see any big, you know, U S military presence in Indonesia or anything. Cause they, they keep it pretty neutral between the U S China and Russia as well. Um, so they might be pushing for it, but I think they're going to be more reluctant. Now the Philippines is an old treaty ally of the U S um, and they're also trying to play both sides to an extent. I think Marcos is going to be a little more, uh, hawkish toward China than Duterte was. 
But all right, the next one here, uh, U.S. warship conducted a Taiwan Strait transit in early November. So a U.S. Navy warship sailed through the Taiwan Strait on November 5th, but the transit was not made public at the time. And this is according to the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. He just announced this recently. He said that the guided missile destroyer USS Benfold made the transit, marking the fourth U.S. warship to do so since July. So he said that the U.S. has been sending warships through the Taiwan Strait about once a month, and that's been the rate. Uh, it increased. Again, this is something we talk about this U.S. military activity in the region. This increased under Trump, and 12 was was a lot uh, for when it happened, you know, 12 times that a U.S. warship sailed through the strait. So once a month uh, was a significant number of, of these transits for the U.S. to do. And that happened under Trump. And it's really continued under Biden, you know, like 11, 12 a year, it seems like. Although it does seem like there's been a little downturn since China launched those major military exercises around Taiwan in August in response to Nancy Pelosi visiting the island. I haven't seen all the numbers, but I know U.S. sorties in the region, surveillance flights, which really increased in recent years um, under Trump and under Biden. Of course, this all started with Obama's you know, pivot to Asia. Trump really ramped it up and Biden picked it up even more. Um, but at, you know, in the aftermath of these major Chinese drills, and China has kept up kind of the pressure by, by flying warplanes across the median line, which separates the Taiwan Strait. So it seems like the U.S. has backed off a little bit in its military presence around there. Um, but I'm sure it's going to pick back up if it, if it hasn't already. Um, all right. So the next one here, this is an interesting one. Well, it's about uh, China and Cambodia. They, they have agreed to, well, they're saying that they're going to increase uh, military ties. So Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen on Sunday thanked China's People's Liberation Army for helping to develop its own armed forces, adding that he hoped both militaries will strengthen cooperation. So during a meeting in Phnom Penh with General Wang, sorry, General Wei Fenghe, who is the Chinese defense minister, Hun Sen also said Cambodia hoped to maintain peace with China in the South China Sea. Earlier this month, he met with President Biden who repeated Washington's concerns about the Ream Naval Base. So this is what's interesting. Cambodia's Ream Naval Base. A few years ago, they, you know, the U.S. built some stuff there, and I think they, like, demolished a building that the U.S. built, or they moved it. I think they said they were moving it, and the U.S. got upset about that. And then they made a deal with China. China is going to help them with some construction at the port. And the U.S., of course, wasn't happy and wanted... Uh, you know, they're accusing China of trying to build a military base there. And they want all this information out of Cambodia. And I guess they weren't happy with it. So they actually sanctioned some Cambodian military officials and actually imposed, uh, you know, kind of a soft arms embargo, restricted some arms exports to Cambodia over it. And then that really backfired uh, because after that, Cambodia signed this new military deal with China, just looking to boost ties. You know, it's they're still saying um, there's not going to be a Chinese base in Cambodia. They say that their constitution does not allow for foreign military bases, um, but they are increasing ties with China. And, and you know, the U.S. wants to work, use all these countries against China. But you just really saw how their pressure uh, and their demands just backfired on Cambodia. I mean, look at a map. Look where China is compared to Cambodia, compared to the U.S., um, but so, yeah, I mean, this is just a few stories here about the U.S. and, and China and, and just the situation in Southeast Asia. You know, if God forbid if this Cold War, new Cold War between the U.S. and China ever turns hot, this is where it's going to be played out is uh, around Taiwan and, and in Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea. Um, that's the hot spot. Um, so it's it's something to keep an eye on. All right, so the next one here, um, more of a flare-up between Turkey and the Kurds in, in northern Syria. So Syrian Kurdish militants fire rockets into Turkey. So Turkey's interior minister on Monday said that three people were killed after rockets hit the Turkish district of Karkamis, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, but it's near the Syrian border. And the rocket attack came a day after Turkey launched massive airstrikes in northern Iraq and Syria 
against Kurdish groups for their alleged role in a recent bombing in Istanbul. Dozens were reported killed in the strikes, including members of the U.S.-backed Kurdish-led SDF. So this, you know, the names get confusing. I don't really understand it exactly. I know that the PKK is a group that's active in Turkey that they consider a terrorist group, and the U.S. and the EU also consider a terrorist group. But then when you cross the border into Syria, there's the YPG, which Turkey says, and it does seem like they are the PKK affiliate in, in Syria. They're really the same group. But the YPG is part of the SDF, which the U.S. openly backs. And then there's also the PYD, which is another group in Syria. But pretty much they're all kind of the same thing under the umbrella of the SDF and the Rojava, what they call this Kurdish autonomous area of um, Syria. So dozens, so when they launched these airstrikes, dozens were reported killed. And according to, sorry, now this is the rocket attacks on Monday. So according to reports, the SDF fired the rockets into um, Turkey from the Syrian, from a Syrian border town. And the group did not take credit, official credit for the attacks, but did vow to take action in response to Turkey's airstrikes. And there were more reported Turkish airstrikes on Monday, which have not, which weren't confirmed by Ankara. But according to the to AP, the Turkish Defense Ministry did confirm that it launched fresh artillery strikes. So the rocket attacks are a sign that Turkey's operations in the region will continue. And Erdogan, the Turkish president, has has basically is warning that he's preparing a ground offensive. He told reporters, quote, there is no question that this operation be limited to only an aerial operation. How many troops from the land forces should be involved here will be decided together by our relevant units, our defense ministry and general staff. We do our consultation and then we will take steps accordingly, end quote. So um, it sounds like he's preparing, a, a you know, an invasion, uh, really, Um and Turkish officials have accused the U.S. of complicity in the Istanbul bombing for backing the SDF. And uh, Turkey's communication director blamed the Western support for the Kurdish groups for these rocket attacks. And on Twitter wrote, these attacks show once again um, that Western support for this terror group in the name of fighting other terror groups like ISIS is a total fa failure. You cannot fight terrorists with terrorists, end quote. So that is, you know, why the U.S. backs um, the SDF initially was to fight, help them fight ISIS. But now it's more about the U.S. maintaining a presence in Syria by backing these Kurdish groups. They can control a pretty big portion of the country with only having a thousand troops there. And that's all part of the campaign against Damascus, the sanctions campaign, the brutal economic sanctions on the country that are just devastating to the civilian population as a UN special rapporteur uh, recently went over. Um, so, you know, it's not about ISIS. It's really about that, but it's always been an issue. And, you know, I might've missed it. I looked around pretty good. I didn't see any U S statements about this situation. And I asked the state department in their, you know, press and query thing. They were, they used to give me like answers and now they, they kind of stopped answering me, but I didn't hear back from them. They usually at least get back to me and tell me that they can't give me an answer, but um, I didn't hear back from them. So, you know, it's just uh, strange that they're silent on it. Well, maybe it's not really strange because it is kind of a tricky situation for them, um, but it's going to complicate things. And Finland sees the Istanbul bombing as a potential hindrance to NATO talks. This is the next story, sorry. Uh, as a potential hindrance to NATO talks with Turkey. So Finland's foreign minister said Saturday that last week's bombing, the bombing took place last week in Istanbul, uh, which Turkey blamed on the PKK, could hinder talks with Turkey on joining NATO. Turkey has held up Finland and Sweden's NATO bids over their alleged support for the PKK and other Kurdish groups. Um, so that, that's what it's really all about. And Turkey is seeking the extradition of suspected PKK members, mostly from Sweden. They have more of a Kurdish population. And they've been saying that the Nordic nations have yet to fulfill the deal that they signed uh, to join 
they signed a deal back in June, I believe, with Turkey to join NATO. They said, you, you do this, we'll approve it. But Turkey's parliament still hasn't approved it. So um, in response, again, you know, I think this Finnish official is right because, you know, we're seeing the reaction. Turkish officials are repeatedly saying, first they said specifically the U.S. support for the Kurds, and now they're saying Western support. They're blaming it for the rocket attack. So I think this definitely is going to complicate uh, their NATO bids. And Sweden has a large, it has again, it has a larger Kurdish population than Finland. And it appears to be having more issues with Turkey than, than Finland does when it comes to reaching a deal on NATO. But they've, you know, Sweden and Finland, they, they've linked their NATO memberships together. They're saying that they're going to join together. And it's unlikely that Turkey would approve one without the other. I think it's a package deal for Turkey. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But I think, you know, it's going to definitely delay it for a while at least. All right, the next one here, Germany to deploy Patriot system to Poland after Ukrainian missile incident. Poland said Monday that Germany will deploy a U.S.-made Patriot air defense missile system to the Polish border with Ukraine. The agreement comes less than a week after a Ukrainian air defense missile hit a grain depot in a Polish village, killing two people. So Poland's defense minister announced this on Twitter, saying that he accepted this offer from Germany. Germany said it the other day that it has made this offer. And he's saying they've accepted it with satisfaction. And what's interesting here is that Poland and Germany have kind of been at, at odds with each other. Poland has been accusing uh, Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, and his government of being too hesitant to arm Ukraine. You know, they've been slow to send heavier weapons when Poland has been sending a bunch of tanks and things like that. And they also recently asked uh, Germany for $1.3 trillion in war reparations from World War II. So things have not been uh, too uh, great between Germany and Poland, but despite that, they're cooperating on this. And um, the technical agreements of this detail are still being worked out. I think it might also involve German warplanes, you know, flying in the area on the border of Ukraine. Um, so, you know, it's more, you know, NATO infrastructure in Poland bordering Ukraine. And, you know, I just go over, which I did a bunch last week, the incident in Poland, um, you know, and how it really led to the first major rift between Ukraine and its Western backers and how when it news first broke, you know, Zelensky and his advisors are out there saying it's a Russian attack on NATO and, it, and you know, they need a response. I mean, basically calling for World War Three, which, as we all know, could quickly spiral into nuclear war. And so Zelensky, even after the U.S., NATO, and Poland said it was likely a Ukrainian missile that hit Poland, he doubled down and insisted that it was not. But then he backed down slightly, admitting that he didn't know for sure if it was a for sure exactly what missile hit it. But uh, still, I mean, he hasn't come out publicly yet and said, uh, you know, we're sorry that we killed two Poles. Um, so I think it definitely affected things. And I'm sure that there are members of the U.S. government and members of other NATO countries that are, you know, this might have kind of changed their minds on what they, they want to do, you know, down the line when it comes to supporting Zelensky and this government. Uh, and the next one here. So this is from here. I, I got to pull up uh, the New York Times article. So there's this video that's been going around online that looks like uh, Ukraine executed about 10 Russian soldiers that were lying face down in uh, and surrendered in this video that's been going around, I believe, on Telegram and social media. So the New York Times comes out and uh, says that the video is authentic, which was interesting. You know, it, it leaves open, it, and it's not exactly clear, because basically what, what we see here, and, and they actually piece together the videos, is that, you know, it's a combination of a cell phone video and, and saddle uh, overhead, likely drone footage. And it shows Ukrainians moving into this courtyard. And there's Russian soldiers that surrendered and laying face down. And then while they're in the courtyard, another Russian soldier pops out and opens fire. And then the video, you know, that's it for that video. And then in the next video, you know, you don't see exactly what happens. All those Russian soldiers that are laying face down are dead. 
Um, so you assume that they took out the one that opened fire and then turned their guns on the Russian soldiers laying face down. And you can't say for sure exactly what happened, but you know the U.S. and the U.N. say they're looking into it. Uh, who knows how 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 hard they will look into it? But you know the reason why we put this up top is because this is the New York Times saying this, which is surprising. You know, um, to see them cover uh, an alleged Ukrainian war crime like this, and I think it might be another sign that you know there's trouble in paradise <laughs> between the U.S. and Ukraine. All right, so the last story in the news section today, this is from Jason Ditz. So Iran launched more attacks in Iraqi Kurdistan, attacking the Peshmerga, which is a Kurdish group in the region. Um, So one of their fighters were confirmed killed by the Kurds, and uh, but Iran's uh, media, semi-official media, claimed a lot more, saying that 26 were killed in the operations. So, uh, you know, this is about the unrest inside Iran. They're they're accusing, you know, foreign uh, forces of really inciting the unrest. And there's definitely some truth to that. I don't know exactly how much, but we know that Israel has a pretty serious covert presence in Iran. And there are have been some attacks by separatist groups on, on Iranian uh, security forces. Um, but who knows, you know, I can't say if these Kurdish groups that they're attacking have anything to do with it. But so you see them because, you know, Turkey's airstrikes were also launched in uh, in northern Iraq. So the Iraqi Kurds are getting it from from Turkey and Iran right now. And uh, the U.S. did um, come out and condemn these strikes again, still as far as I know, I uh, have been silent on the Turkish ones. Uh, and Iraq said that it strongly condemned the Iranian strikes as a sovereignty violation, as well as Turkish airstrikes that targeted Iraqi Kurdistan a day earlier. So Iraq came out and condemned, condemned these attacks. But this is the first time in, I want to say since September, I'm not exactly sure, because Iran launched a few attacks on on this region in Iraq back in September. And and I think this is the first time since then. And it looks like they use drones and missiles and and things like that. Uh, But that's it for the news for today. It was actually a pretty slow day. And, um, you know, when it comes to the American news, this is going to be a pretty slow week because it's Thanksgiving week. And, you know, a lot of people just take off the whole week now. Um, But we'll be here still. (laughs) Um, And we have a lot of good viewpoints. We have one from Pat Buchanan about Putin's winter war on Ukraine, just about what could be coming in the in, with the winter approaching, possible Russian offensive. One from Ray McGovern about the Dutch court decision on the downing of MH17, the airliner that went down over Ukraine in 2014. So go check that out. A good one from Ron Paul, kind of about, you know, this rift between the U.S. and Ukraine, uh, titled, Is Washington's Dangerous Ukraine Boondoggle Starting to Unravel? Uh, so definitely go read that. His his columns are great. Same thing with Pat Buchanan. I mean, both of them, um, their regular columns are just, you know, usually pretty concise and just written well. And uh, the spotlight by Daniel Larison is, is pretty good at Responsible Statecraft. What might a DeSantis foreign policy look like? So... Um, you know, Ron DeSantis, he's considered a front runner for the Republican nominee. And, you know, Trump has been going after him. Uh, but what a lot of people, I think, might not be aware of is his uh, voting record in Congress. He was very hawkish, uh, you know, specifically against Iran, because he was in there while the Obama administration was negotiating the nuclear deal. And he actually co uh Oh, I want to make sure I get this right because, um, yeah, he, him and Tom Cotton, they co-authored an op-ed in July 2015 uh, against the Iran nuclear deal. So co-authoring something with Tom Cotton, it's not a very good uh, good sign there. <laughs> um, but that's it for me for today. I'll be back tomorrow. Again, it's going to be a slow week, but uh, we'll be here all week. Um, you can support the show, antiwar.com slash donate, like, and subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, 
share the show. And if you want to buy an antiwar.com t-shirt or something like that, you can find the link in the description. Uh, they're pretty high quality. That's a good way to support us. And let me know if you do buy a shirt, send me a picture or something. Um, but that's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for listening.